Hi, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so proud and honored to have Misty all the way from US. We had an interview a couple of days back and she shared her story and most of you have gone through her interview. How many of you have gone through her interview? Say I, just go to the chat and say I. How many of you have gone through the interview and gone through her story, that story of power? She went through the down and the up in her life. Very good, you can see Misty, all of them have gone through your story. And, and some, of, some of you said that she has gone through such a terrifying uh, life and today she is so successful in her career. And that's exactly what we do. We bring leaders into this platform so that you can get directly from the horse's mouth. Rather than I talking about X, Y, Z, you can straight away ask from, uh, from uh, Misty and learn from her because everything that she's gonna talk today is wisdom. It's not like information, it's not, not like data or knowledge or insight. It's a wisdom that you get from somebody who has gone through that. So with all, let me ask Misty to all the way go with your story. There you go. You've got 10 minutes. You can start with your story. Wow. Uh, great. Thank you all for, uh, for having me. Thank you for watching the interview. I appreciate that. Um, so if you've watched the interview, you already know my story, but I'll just give a quick summary just to catch other people up. Um, I, I went from medical school to prison um, behind a really horrific cocaine addiction, um, domestic abuse situation. Um, and it, my life just kind of went on and on and went through a downward spiral. But at the beginning, right up front, I want to say, I didn't respect my moment of choice. And everything bad that happened in my life was due to choices that I and I alone made. It was no one else's fault. Things were, were not always perfect in my life, but I chose the choices I made. So I think it's really important that we step up and take accountability for anything in our lives that has, has taken a turn um, that was in control something that we can because there's things that we can't control but things that we can it's important that we take accountability for it because i think that until you do that you're just you're just living a lie so for my story um farouk and thank you for having me again my pleasure. um i i grew up um in, in a pretty pretty you know my had both my parents in the home i was very active in dance music i was always that kid that won the awards. I was very competitive, always competitive. So I made sure I was number one at everything I did. Um, I put a lot of pressure on myself. Um, and with that, you know, I had a whole perfectionism issue. And over time, that perfectionism ended up being a problem for me. Um, and it still does today with business. Sometimes I procrastinate because I wait on things to be perfect. And it, instead of just jumping in and, and taking the step to take the action, um, <clears throat> so growing up, like I said, I, you know, at 13, I want, I, I knew at 13, I wanted to be a surgeon. It's all I ever dreamed of. I had a lot of medical uh, professionals in my family. Um, none were doctors. They were all nurses, but I, I knew that's what my, my path was going to be. So I worked really hard to get there. Um, I married my college sweetheart. We had two little girls, Lauren and Amber. Um, and then Finally, I had gotten three undergraduate degrees. I had gotten a degree in nuclear medicine, chemistry, and psychology as my undergrad degrees, um, but I knew I was going to go a step further to medical school. So I did apply. I got accepted my first year, which I was really proud of because it's really hard to do here you know, to get in quickly. Um, and then about three months in, I found out my husband had a woman pregnant. And it completely devastated me. I was just floored. I had no idea he was cheating, just oblivious to the whole thing. Um, and it, the world became dark to me. I had seen the world so beautiful before. And now the world was a dark, ugly place um, because of the deceit. I think it was the lying that got me more than anything. So, you know, growing up in the, in the I was in beauty pageant system um, growing up all the way up until my teenage years where I placed for the state of Texas as a runner up um, to go on to the, to the Miss America pageant, which I didn't end up doing, but um, I was very confident, very strong woman. And now I allowed that to, I allowed his cheating to strip me and make me feel as if it was my fault. I, I felt I wasn't good enough for him to have cheated. It must have been something wrong with me. So I internalized it. Um, I fixated on it. And I started thinking less than of myself. I lost my self-esteem. I ended up getting involved with a man that I was dating. And um, 
at 32 years old, a mother of two in medical school, strong woman before now broken. I felt like I was broken. I tried cocaine for the first time in my life. Um, I had been around drugs in college and I, it just, I never even went in that room. It wasn't my deal. It wasn't my scene. I was very against it. Um, I was hit by a drunk driver when I was 15 and almost died. So I was very against the drugs. Um, but at 32, here I was vulnerable. I was, like I said, I felt like I was less than. So I thought, let's give this a try. And when I did, I got addicted to the escape, I think more than the cocaine, the escape that it gave my mind a place where I didn't have to worry about adultery. I didn't have to worry about perfectionism. I didn't have to worry about always looking the part. I didn't have to worry about being good enough in school or smart enough or being accepted. And it just, for me, that was my addiction, that escape. Um, fast forward, I ended up later on falling in love, I thought, with my drug dealer, um, which is my 20-year-old son's father today. They do not have a relationship. But that's my son's choice. He's tried, but my son doesn't want anything to do with him. Um, and he was the first man that ever put his hands on me and abused me, and I'd never been around that before. Um, he broke my nose one night out of the blue and I didn't see it coming and didn't know how to react. Of course, I kicked him out of the house, which is the right thing to do, but he used the cocaine to get me back every time. It was a never ending cycle. He would abuse me, cause the pain, bring the cocaine, which was the antidote to the pain basically. And that's how he kept me at bay. Um, Abusers are extremely manipulative. I have learned through the years, um, now that I've lived through it and I understand it, I'm educated about it. They play on all of our insecurities and they manipulate. And it is such a stronghold. I never understood how women could stay in that, re or men could stay in that relationship. But now having lived through it, I totally understand that it's very controlling, a very powerful thing. Um, so we have to learn from other people that have lived through it and been through it, how to escape it. Um, so he and I were in and out of jail, committing crime, um, you know, writing bad checks, using stolen credit cards, anything we could do to get high. Now I am practicing nuclear medicine at this time. I got out of medical school. I never went back, but I still had my degree in nuclear medicine. I still had my career and I was trying to hold down the job. Um, at some point, there was a cross on the road where the addiction took over my life to the point where I couldn't even maintain the job. And it will happen. If anyone out there listening, you have an addiction and you think, oh, I can manage it. You can for today, but I promise you, if you keep going, there will be a day that you'll make that cross as well. And it will take over your life because that's just, it's inevitable. Um, so we were in and out of jail. He was in jail at the time I had just gotten out of jail because my parents always came to my rescue. They believed in me and, and wanted more for me. Um, looking back, I wish they'd have left me in jail because I think it would have been a better lesson for me than being bailed out. But that's things we learn as we go. That's why we're here to educate now and give back. Um, so I had gotten out. He was in jail. I was out doing the wrong things, getting high in a neighborhood. I didn't know the town. These two girls um, saw me as a target, thought they were going to take over my car, steal it. They attacked me. They punched me in the face. I ended up losing control in my vehicle. It started sliding down the road, and I hit a parked vehicle in the driveway of a house. And it, that parked vehicle, in turn, struck a woman that was standing in her yard, and it knocked her into her house, and it killed her. And... Um, I didn't know it. I was unconscious. I had been up for four days on a cocaine, what we call a mission, where we're just 24-7 doing drugs. And um, the next thing I remember, I opened my eyes and my mom was standing over me and she was crying. And I looked up and I said, Mama, I'm okay. I remembered I had been in a wreck, but I had no idea I'd killed someone. And she's like, honey, don't you know what's happened? And I, I lifted my arms to hug my mama and I felt that cold, angry handcuff around my wrist and I was chained to that bed and I knew something awful had happened. And she said to me, you've killed someone. And I couldn't, I just, I couldn't even comprehend those words. It was like the gurney in the hospital became quicksand and I was being sucked in and every breath was being just squeezed out of my lungs. Um, I have never been suicidal, but I have felt extremely guilty for being the one that lived. Um, 
I didn't know how to live without the cocaine. I didn't know if I wanted to live. And I certainly had a lot of guilt and shame over what had happened. So I went into a very deep depression in jail. I was facing a 40-year prison sentence for vehicular homicide. I thought my life was over. I thought I would never see my kids again, much less them ever want to talk to me again. And um, I missed my, my oldest daughter, Lauren. I had just missed her high school graduation because I was incarcerated. But she wrote me a letter and she said, Mama, I love you. This isn't you. You're lost. And you need to forgive yourself because that wreck was an accident and you need to throw it away. Get all those things out of you that haunt you at night, that keep you awake, all the things that you're beating yourself up for. She said, you write them down, write them down, write them down, pray over them and just give it away. So I followed my daughter's advice and I did it. And it allowed me enough of that wall of shame to come down so that I could see inside that I had pain that I was hurting inside. I had never dealt with the adultery issue. I had abortions during my drug abuse that I never even stopped to grieve because I was just high, 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 high. And I had pain that I needed to work through. We can't just cover stuff up. We have to work through the pain. And so I started writing my book, What Goes Up. <laughs> there it is, What Goes Up. I actually wrote it over seven months by hand with a pen and paper in jail, um, and it saved my life. The writing is the therapy that saved my life. It, it let me rediscover who I was, because after the abuse, I didn't even know what kind of music I liked, what food I liked, because he stripped me of, of my identity, basically. So it let me rediscover Misty, fall in love with Misty again. I had to work really long and hard to forgive myself, um, but I knew I had to, because that guilt was eating me up. It was ruining my life and it was robbing me of my future. So I got out, I got a, a reduced sentence of uh, five years with the lesser charge of negligent homicide, which is what saved my nuclear medicine career because it's a nonviolent crime. And I'm like a cat. I always tend to land on all four feet straight up, like, you know, just pick it right back up again. I got my career back again. I got my family back again. Was very blessed and and was able to rebuild a life so nine years forward i didn't want these people these doctors i'm working with to know about that dark ugly misty from the past so i was too ashamed to release that book that i had written and then my grandbaby my first grandbaby eliana was born on september 18th which is the same exact day that the wreck happened on september 18th and she came out with um she got stuck in the birth canal and had a brain injury due to a lack of oxygen, came out blind and deaf. She couldn't suck or cry. She had a feeding tube, couldn't even regulate her own temperature. And I couldn't connect with her because I realized I was letting the guilt. I was convinced because she was born on the same exact day of the wreck that that was my punishment. That I actually caused that baby to have all those problems. And it was a really hard time for me. That period was almost as hard for me as when I first realized I'd killed someone because I felt that same shame, that same guilt all over again, that this is my fault. Here I go. I've taken someone else's life now. I've, I've robbed something else that I didn't, you know, I, why do I keep landing on my feet and I'm hurting the people around me? So I had to do some soul searching and I realized that I was brought through everything I had come through for a reason. And it wasn't to sit silent. It wasn't to sit and wallow in self-pity. It wasn't to feel sorry for myself that I realized my new journey in life was to get out there and educate people and teach people that by speaking up, by stepping up to be that one and being transparent about what we've been through, that's how we're going to make the world a better place. That's how we're going to help ease suffering in the world because through transparency, we educate and we can judge less and mentor more. And I think that's what we're missing right now. I think cohesively we need to come together we need to stop judging each other we need to learn from each other the good and the bad and that's my mission that's my journey that's what i'm set out to do um, i'm very passionate about it and um i i appreciate you farouk for having me here to be able to talk about transparency wow thank you um, thank you very <laughs> much for being so transparent and sharing your story now uh, in this uh, 10 minutes, what I learned is about choice, the importance of choice that you can make in your life, accountability that was very powerful, 
don't go for perfection and don't procrastinate. Be wherever you are. Um, then comes a strong your uh, self-esteem. We spoke about just before uh, you came and you joined us, Misty, we spoke about suicidal cases. And that's exactly what you mentioned here that uh, people, when they start, the self-esteem goes down, they go, get into suicidal, but you are very strong from within. And that made you a strong woman who you are standing today as a leader. Uh, people escape, they look uh, for something we, to escape from the pain. And uh, when it came to Misty, she looked for cocaine and she, that was the escape for her. And uh, it's it's something which is easily available. Then what I learned next one is you got to forgive yourself and give up, give up your your past and you have to go forward fall in love with yourself uh, spend your time you got to have a clear mission so that you can go misty has got a very very clear mission i would like all of you to type two lessons that you learned from this strong story please go to the chat two lessons that you learned shots just short words or statement go ahead please all of you thank you very much misty i just thank want you. to make sure that they are engaged with your story Please yes, I ahead. love your style. <laughs> Thank you. I love your style. I, I like to say, I'm the same way when I teach. I like the feedback to know they're, they're engaged. Absolutely, absolutely. Amazing attitude, strong and bold, self-esteem, believe in yourself, forgive yourself, uh, the choice, the attitude, being bold, uh, uh, have patience, very good, okay. Uh, patience, being bold, trust yourself, don't lose hope, very good. That's absolutely correct. I want everyone to participate. Everyone, can please come. Okay, determination and patience to move on. Be positive, bold, and patient. Very good. What else? Forgive yourself. Yes, passionate. You got to be passionate. Yes, she is very passionate now to be trans, uh, <laughs> transparent and teach us. Uh, be strong when difficult situation comes around. You uh, resilience. Okay, then be positive, determination. Absolutely fantastic. That's great. Thank you very much. All of you, I would like you to uh, go and say thank you to Misty, please. Go go to the chat and say thank you. Thank you so much. All of you, just say thank you to Misty. <laughs> Once you're done that, I want you to type, we are blessed having you here. I want everyone to type, we are blessed having you here. Please go ahead. After you, thank you. After you, thank you. Please say that we are blessed to have you here. And it's a blessing for me to be here as well. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Now, Shamir, you can take over from here, Shamir. And uh, anybody who wants to ask questions, learn because this is a golden opportunity for you. This is not like cross questioning and putting Misty down. You're, this is a chance to learn from a teacher. Okay, from a leader. This is the best chance. So any questions that you would like to ask Thank Misty, and you can start from there. Uh, so uh, Shamir, you can take control from here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sensei. Anyone who wants to ask the questions, uh, they can unmute themselves and uh, ask questions. Misty, I'm Rajesh from India. Hello. I just wanted to know what is the work that you do now to bring these drug addicts out of addiction? And how does your family support you in this? The work I'm, I've been doing up to now has been speaking. I try to get, get to as many places as I can where I think the women, and I focus mainly on women because women seem to be the ones that gravitate to my story. Um, the message is for anyone that needs to hear it. But um, speaking in prisons, speaking in schools is real important to me, especially at a middle, a middle school age, like a junior high level, because I feel like that's the time these women, these young girls, they need to start building their self-esteem and learn about addiction and abuse and those things and how to um, deter it if they see it coming in their life. Learn some tools um, about how to step up and fight it, fight back against it, not physically fight back, but fight back against the direction their, their life is headed in. As far as my family support, um, my family's amazing. I did an interview on my show a few days ago, a few weeks ago with all three of my children present at the same time. And we talked through a lot of pain and I'm just blessed because my children know forgiveness. They've all chosen it with me and we have built very strong relationships today. All of my family. I don't have anyone in my family that I don't have a relationship because of anything like this. I mean, they've all rallied around me. And I think it's important to point out, it's what a person does on the other side of their adversity that makes, that sets them apart. Um, 
And there's people that talk all the time about things they've been through, but what do they do with it? You know, I think it's having that passion and being driven with passion and having the courage to step up and talk about the real stuff, not sugarcoat it, not make it look good on a screen or a TV show or what we think they want to hear, but the truth about it, the things that really go on when you're in addiction. For instance, when I talk to young girls, I talk to them straight up honest about prostitution. I remember the day in my addiction when I said I would never do that for drugs. And I also very vividly remember the day that I did it for drugs. And so I want women to understand that never say never. There's always the day that's going to happen. And I talk with honesty and transparency to get that message across. And I think that's what sets me apart. I'd like to think that's what sets me apart is that I am so transparent. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Next, please. Next. Somebody has to have a question. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It Can might I be. ask one more? Yes, please. Yes, yes please. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rajesh again, I just wanted to know, uh, uh, writing doesn't come automatically to anybody. Were you a writer when you were in college or school? I've always had a passion for poetry. I used to write poetry, nothing really published. Um, but I've always, I've always enjoyed writing. Um, I can tell you I was in a rehab um, facility once because I did try to get better. I went in and out of rehab several times before my incarceration. Um, and we had to, to be able to graduate. We had to write our life story and stand up in front of all the other people in the rehab and, and speak about our life story. And I sat down one night and I, I, had, I thought at this point in my life, I thought I had raised, I thought I was raised in the perfect home with the perfect parents. My life was wonderful. And I was just the screw up, right? That I just made a bad choice one day and screwed my life up. So when I was in this rehab, listening to other women getting ready to exit, talk about their uncles had raped them. Their mom was prostituting them. They grew up in this horrible environment. I'm thinking to myself, what the heck am I going to get up there and say that didn't happen to me? I didn't have anybody rape me. I didn't, I didn't have anybody forcing drugs, shooting me up with drugs to make me conform. I mean, I had a happy childhood. So when I sat down to write my life story, I had a block. Nothing would come out. And I told my counselor, I can't, I can't, nothing's coming out. She's like, well, you can't leave here till you do it. Give it time. It took me three days. It took me three days for that pen to start moving across the paper. But when it did, I'm telling you, things came out of me that I had suppressed with food or cocaine, whatever it was to stuff those feelings down of reality, things came out of me that I remember did happen to me along my way as a child that I never even knew. And so give it, if you're not a writer, it doesn't come automatically, give yourself the space to become what you need to become. Give yourself the time, but just don't give up. Keep sitting down with that blank piece of paper and that pen because one day it will come out. And when it does, it's going to be the most beautiful story ever. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Misty. Yes. Hi, Misty. Hello. Yeah, I'm Rashid from Dubai. Hi. <laughs> yeah, I have a uh, simple question related to your book. Yes, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, why do you make uh, what goes up arrow down? Okay, that's a great question. I'm glad that I'm glad that you noticed that. Actually, that's very yeah, clever yeah, yeah. by my graphic yeah, yeah. designer. Yeah, yeah, just noticed. Yeah, when you show me this. <laughs> yes, thank you. That's a very good eye. Um, originally, when I was in jail and I wrote the book, I wrote the the title "What Goes Up Must Come Down," because I'm thinking to myself. You know, when I was on cocaine, I was high. I was up. I felt as if I had no worries in the world. I didn't have any responsibilities. I didn't have any bills to pay. Well, I mean, I did. I just wasn't paying them. But then I realized that when you come down off of that high, you, you still have adultery in your life. You still have bills to pay. You still have kids to raise. You still have all these responsibilities. But now you're so much more. Now you're a crack addict, too or a drug addict or whatever it is. So I realized what goes up is always gonna come down. And that was the title of the book. Um, 
it was written in jail. I was very angry. This was right after the wreck had happened. It took me seven months. I hadn't really worked through everything yet. So it was written with a very dark tone. Um, I did a lot of blaming other people. Um, like anger and blame, I think was the biggest tone of the book. And so when I got ready nine years later and decided to make my move and step up and release it, I rewrote the book. I rewrote it from a place of accountability and forgiveness, which is, which I think is what's the, like I said in the beginning, the first step is that accountability portion of it, taking responsibility for your choices and your own actions. And so um, it was to be an inspiration and uplifting book. And when I went to the publishers on their direction, they felt that what goes up must come down would be too negative for an inspirational book. So my graphic designer was very clever and stuck the down arrow on it, which kind of gives it the same connotation. So thank you for, for seeing that. Wow. <laughs> thank you. Yes. N next, please. Hey, please, please mute yourself. Please mute yourself. Okay. I, I have a question. Yes, please. Yes. Introduce yourself. Hi, Ms. J. My name is Jaffa. I'm from Qatar. And uh, I'm really uh, impressed, you know, that uh, the 10 minutes you've spoken here, it touched our heart, actually. Thank you very much. And uh, and uh, wish, you, uh, wish you a happy Independence Day, 4th of July. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the, 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 I have a question here. As a father of a teenage girl, uh, what exactly I supposed to advise her become strong for overcome a difficult situation? I think number one is that she needs to, rec I think you need to encourage her to recognize her talents and her strengths. Oftentimes we're so critical. We want so much of our children. We want them to be better, do better. But, but as we are being parents to them, to push them, sometimes we don't recognize the things they already have, the value that they already bring. Um, teach her that it's okay to be who she is, where she is. Um, I know a lot of young girls ha feel they have to conform to what society calls the perfect woman. You know, it used to be back in the day, plumper women were the, mo you know, is what men desire. Now it's considered really, really thin women. And so a lot of young girls starve themselves to try to look like what people look like on TV. And Oftentimes those are photoshopped, airbrushed, and these young girls don't realize that that's not a real person, you know, on the front, front page of that magazine, that they need to learn to love who they are, how they were created, and, and be comfortable. Because I believe that the most powerful, the most powerful love is the love of yourself and the confidence that comes from within. I think that you can be from what's in your heart, your confidence and your self-esteem was going to carry you so far in life, so far, even if you don't reach your goals, if you're confident about your journey, you're confident about the, the things you've done along the way, and then you respect your decisions, I think we need to teach them that that's what's the most important thing. Wow. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Next, please. And that was that was from Middle East, uh, Qatar. It's uh, he, he just called you from the Middle East and the other gentleman called you from Dubai. There's all are different countries. That's amazing. Right. Next, please. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Misty. Hello. I'm Sh Hello. Uh, I'm Shafiq from India. Hi, Shafiq. How are you? I'm, I'm blessed. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it's so nice to talk with you. And also your stories are so inspirational for us because you have faced such a very challenging time, but still you are strong and bold and you are so transparent and you like to share your stories to others because they also get benefit out of that. So my question is this. Now, due to Corona, all people are, you know, uh, under depressed and traveling is not possible. Everybody face some kind of difficulty. So what's your advice not able to move from their place to another? 
so wise to those because it's a tough time uh, it's an un, you know uncertain moment for future so my question is that hope you got okay shafiq i lost you you the audio cut out on us right after you said people are becoming yes. depressed Could yes you kind of from there yes and re- re- yes what's your advice to those who are depressed due to this corona virus uh, they lost their job they cannot move from one place to another so this is an un, you know uh, uncertain situation so that's my question thank you so much well i think depression is is you know an automatic thing that's going to sit in the economy for all countries across the world has been hit really hard with this um there's so much uncertainty and you know i'm in the medical field i have my own opinions and my own um my own belief systems but that's you know we're not going to get into that but i think that it's inevitable that this is happening to to people becoming depressed but i think this is also a great time for us to do some searching maybe pivot our life a little bit and say okay we know going forward things are not going to go back to the new you know they're not going to be normal whatever normal was before we we know going forward things are going to be different in the world from this day forward we know that so i think it's it's also we can look at things negative or we can make a choice to turn it around and look at the positive in it and that's how i I've, i've been able to make my days you know um happy days is to choose the positive every time i i think like a proton i think positively mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm. so i think moving forward look at this as an opportunity to make changes and and be better do better start something different in your life start a next chapter instead of moping and being depressed about i can't go back to this job well maybe maybe this is your opportunity to find a better job maybe this is your opportunity to create a better job maybe this is your opportunity while you're at home to get an education because you can learn online you don't have to physically go somewhere to learn you don't even have to go to a university you can go to the good old youtube and learn pretty much anything if you want to build a driveway and pour cement and you don't know how just jump on youtube and you learn how right so i mean this is an op- this is a golden opportunity for a lot of people that are like my I'll use my son for example he's 20 years old he was going to school for for medicine to go to medical school and he's been shut down with the coronavirus he lost his job but he's in in our country I don't know how it works in yours but in our country we have unemployment for the people that were furloughed mm-hmm. so he's been able to still pay his rent and buy groceries but it was a golden opportunity for him to to learn and and, and do other things so there's people that you know can change your entire career during this time and just find your passion it's also a wonderful time for families to reengage and get that family bond back i mean we get so tied up in it it's a two person income at least in america it takes both people in the household to work nowadays to support a family it pretty much does so it we get so stressed and and we get so divided with our jobs and the sports with our kids and all the things in life that we've lost our bond. We don't sit down at the kitchen table and eat dinner together anymore like we did back in the day. So I think this quarantine time is if we choose to let it be is a positive time to bring that family unit back together and start instilling those values in our children that we lost through so many generations because of media, because of our busy lives, because of it taking more people to work to support a household. So I think it's about like I said choosing to look at the positive and finding a way to make it better. Wow. Very powerful, very powerful. Thank you. Thank you so much for your advice and your suggestions. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next please. Hi Ms. T. I'm Anand from Kerala, Cochin. india india okay hi <laughs> yeah i like the way you told uh, perfection is not required what is required is be where you are and do what you can the best so i like that actually so i would like to say thanks for that wow. thank you <laughs> and uh, to as per my perception coming out of a drug abuse is one of the toughest thing so congrats for you to do that effectively thank you 
and, you, and, and if you have if you had gone through the interview of Ms. D, she speaks about the three percent and she falls in the three percent because only three percent of people can uh, get rid of the drug. And after nine years, when she looked back, she was still away from drug and that what made her strong. Yes, woke me up. I realized I was a three percenter and that I, I survived it for a reason and I needed to do something with it. Yes. Absolutely. And I want to speak on that real quick too, yeah. um, on perfectionism, if you give me just yeah. a minute. Sure, for that. sure, sure, sure. You know, it's a constant struggle. When I, I have a talk show called Dare to Share with Misty Lane, where I encourage people to come on and be transparent and, and just step up. And oftentimes the guests have never shared before and it's their first time to share. Mm -hmm. um, it took me, I've had the idea for that show for over a year, but I wanted the graphics just right. I wanted the branding logo, the name. I wanted to have a studio. I wanted everything so perfect that month after month after month was going by and I still hadn't started the show. And finally, I, I coached with someone and, and finally they got through to my thick skull head and, and made me understand that I was procrastinating waiting on perfectionism. And that's an important lesson because it's never going to be good enough. It's never going to be perfect. So we have to just jump in and start. And I'm so glad I did because it's those little mistakes that weren't just right in the beginning that we learn from that I think make us unique and it makes a better show because we grow from it. So I just want to point that out. That's a, that's a never ending battle. Absolutely. absolutely. Recently you had a show where you spoke about your interview with me. I did. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I was being interviewed on someone else's show. Uh -huh. It wasn't my show. Yeah, I was being interviewed on someone else's show and I spoke about the opportunity being able to speak, you know, internationally is always a wonderful thing to spread transparency message out for the world. And um, just because I adore you, I, I just love the things you're doing because I feel that, that your heart is in it, Farouk. And Absolutely. It's very easy for me to see through people. I can, I know the people that are there that just want the fame or the spotlight versus the people that have heart in it. And I feel that you definitely have heart in it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Next question, please. Rajesh here again. Just wanted to know, do you have another book coming up? Wow. <laughs> I do actually, I, I have started it. I haven't been real aggressive with it. I've, you know, that whole perfectionism thing again, but I'm working through it. It's actually a different type of book. I'm going to name it Jail Tales. And this is a little bit comical. Um, <laughs> having a chemistry degree, when I went to jail, there's so much, there, or, you know, people don't really know what goes on inside of a jail or a prison. You, you see shows, TV shows, or you have an idea, but until you're there, you really don't understand the things that I saw the things that I witnessed, some were just hilarious and some were horrific. Um, I'll give you an example. I, I witnessed women chopping up coffee and snorting it and getting high on coffee grinds. I mean, I've witnessed people drying, taking days and days and days to dry lettuce leaves that they got on their lunch tray and then rolling it up in paper and smoking it because they, they were fiending for a cigarette so bad. I mean, smoking lettuce, literally. Um, and then I've seen... At night, you know, laying in my bed, quiet, I've seen prison guards hand gloves to groups of women when a, a woman came in with drugs, in, they call it keistering, you know, she had hidden drugs up inside of her and came into the jail to profit on them. And they had known it. And that prison guard actually gave those girls the gloves and they took her upstairs in the bathroom. And I mean, they just, they violated her and got the drugs out of her. And I mean... So there's things that go on in there and I'm writing a book about it. It's called Jail Tales. I, I want it to have more of a comical spin on it. Um, like I said, being a chemist, I, you know, I'm all about, you know, being a, a beauty pageant my whole life. I'm all about the, the makeup and stuff. So in jail, we don't get any of that. Mm -hmm. So I made my own. I took toothpaste and black ink mm -hmm. and took a toothbrush to make mascara. I would take Vaseline and red ink to make lipstick. And one of my funniest stories is we were going to court one day. I had to go in front of the judge and I didn't have anything for my hair. So I took Jolly Rancher hard candies 
and I shook them up in a bottle of water until they dissolved. It took a couple of days. And then I used that sugar water to like, like hairspray to scrunch my hair to go, in, to go to court. And it worked perfectly until I got back from jail. I mean, I got back from the court system and I was walking out in the yard doing laps and honeybees attacked my head because of the sugar. And I had to run inside and jump in the shower. So, I mean, it's just a fun little book about things that really happen in jail, stuff like that. Wow. This is what makes you creative. <laughs> this is what makes you creative. When every doors are blocked, then your mind starts working, your brain starts working. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Because people ask me a lot about things and like, what was it like in jail? Um, you know, you don't think about, don't sleep with your head to the bar, sleep with, you know, put your head on the inside of your cell, not, not, you know, so that your feet are the ones that's, that's out there. You don't think of those things because you've never been in jail, but those things are real. Um, there are real threats in jail. I mean, people threatened my life a lot because I killed someone in the community. Um, those two girls that attacked me had told people that I ran this lady down in a drug deal because they didn't want any culpability. They didn't want accountability for their part in causing the wreck. So the community thought I was this horrible person that just ran this lady down over drugs. I never saw her. I couldn't have stopped my car if I had because my car was sliding out of control. Um, so there's a lot, um, you know, I had a lot of threats on my life when part of my story I didn't tell in the 10 minutes, which I'd like to share with you now is in the middle of the night, my, the jail cells of my particular cell opened up and a lady came in crying. Um, she was uh, drunk, had been drinking and she was arrested for that. And I didn't know her. She didn't know me, but I stayed up about two hours talking to her. I gave her a t-shirt to wear. I gave her some of my food I had bought from commissary and we just talked, you know, two women talking. She was crying because she was married to another woman and her, her wife had uh, died and she missed her, but she also had cancer and she was suicidal. So she was glad she was gone and she was glad she was out of pain. So I, I didn't really know what to say to her. I just kind of consoled her. And then we went to bed the next morning when those bars opened up and we went to general, what we call general population, where all the people from all the individual rooms come out and meet for breakfast, people are pointing at us and we're looking at each other like, who are you? Why? What's all the whispering about? And somebody hollered out, that's the lady that killed your wife. And she looked at me, she said, you killed her? And I looked at her and I said, she had cancer? So that was an instrumental moment. I call that an orchestrated ballet in my journey because as I told you in the beginning, it was really hard for me just to wake up and take that breath of air because of the guilt I was ridden with. So <clears throat> my religious background, my religious beliefs is I was taught growing up that if someone is suicidal, their soul does not go up to what we call our heaven. Um, and so by me taking her life, her being suicidal and in pain with cancer, I felt I had just saved her soul because the next time she might've tried to commit suicide, she might've been successful. So by me killing her, she, her soul went to heaven. That was what I clung to. That's what gave me the, the courage and the strength to the one positive note that I could see in that to build on every day. And what it did for her is, like I said, the, the word on the street was that I killed her and ran her down over a drug deal. So now she's thinking, was my wife into drugs? What's going on? So it gave her closure. It gave her, she was able to know then that it was a total accident. There was no drug deal involved. So it was a beautiful orchestrated event because she should have never even been in my jail cell, much less my unit, but forever, whatever power someone turned their head and let her in. She could have come in and killed me. She could have come in and put a shot of heroin in my arm. I mean, but for whatever reason, she was allowed in there and put in my cell. And I believe it was for me to see the good and want to live. Um, yeah. Wow. So powerful. I might've gotten off track. I'm sorry if I did, <laughs> but I felt that was important to say. Yeah, it is. It is. It's very important for those who haven't, uh, watch your interview. Thank yes. you. Next question, please. We'll take three more questions. Next question, please. Yes, please go ahead. No 
Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask me anything. I promise. I'll be transparent. Yes, please. A question that you're, that you're thinking up right now. I promise. Hello, Ms. G. Hello. Thank you. I'm Shamira from India. Hi. You are really an optimist. And uh, I was about to cry. Oh. I was about to cry uh, listening to your story. And uh, you inspired me a lot. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. I would like to ask you something. That first question is, what inspires uh, you the most? Uh, second one. Sometimes we all go to the past. Uh, the, this memory is always attached. us. How much ever of optimist we are, sometimes uh, it would annoy, annoy us. I think you also uh, face the same situation. So how do you pick up from uh, this? How do you allow yourself to come out from this? Okay. Well, I think I'll answer the first one first. What inspires me the most, I believe, is remembering the feeling I had when I was too scared to live moving forward because I felt so guilty from my past. So I think what inspires me is knowing that we can overcome our worst to live our best. All of us can. So it inspires me to get out there and shout that and be transparent and teach because of it. And the second thing is you're right. We all can be an optimistic all day long, but there are days that we're down. There are days that we feel bad about things and we get down on ourselves. And I believe, I call those therapeutic days. And the reason I call those therapeutic days is because I don't ever want to forget what I've been through. I don't ever want to get so far away from it that I forget the pain, that I forget the trauma of it. Because I believe if we forget, we lose the passion. So I just, I, I let it happen. And I say, okay, I'm going to give this the one day to be down. If I want to overeat, if I want to lay on the couch and be a slug, whatever it is, I allow myself that one day. But what, what's important is you don't let it become a second day or a third day or a fourth day. You give yourself the space to remember, and that'll reignite that passion of why you're doing it. And then you get up that next day and you fight it and you move forward and you say, okay, I just got that little reignition. Now I'm back on fire. Let's get out there and, and let's help ease some suffering in the world. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank yeah. you. Two more questions, please. It's a great questions, by the way. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, what's your name and where are you calling from? Rafiq here from Qatar. Okay. Glad to meet you here. Misty. Thank you. Sorry for not being in the camera because my clarity in the network is not that much. So I'm getting break. Okay. So emotional, so emotional. However, I didn't feel much this time because a few days ago I watched your interview with Mr. Sensei. That made me leery, I sweat because he kind of uh, tears down. It was so emotional. You are strong at the time. My, my question is, you said your turning point also, also from so many tragedy in life, feeling guilty until you meet prison wall. So ever you felt yourself before that you are in a wrong way and you have to fix that. You tried, but something was deeply addicted. If you felt that, what was talking to you? That is my question. Okay, I apologize. I had a really hard time understanding the last yeah. part of that. Yes, please. Once again, if you, Rafiq, could you just repeat that because I couldn't catch for you. Sure, for sure, for sure. Yeah. My question is, you are you are in, you are committing the mistakes in the first life which, before. So ever you stop to fix it before, but you couldn't fix it. Something was stopping you. So again, it is the problem was repeating from your side. Is my question is clear? Okay, so so what's the question then? Uh, yeah, she was going back. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, she was trying. She was uh, she was trying. She was uh, realizing that she was committing the mistakes. Yeah. Then again, but it was she couldn't stop yeah. from your side. So yeah. what was stopping you to fix it yourself? So okay. you may be feeling that okay. I'm committing something. I'm making mistakes. I want to fix, but I couldn't make something is uh, forcing me behind my mind. So I cannot fix myself. 
So until you reach the prison wall, you then only you realize then that I have to change myself. That was the that was the changing moment to happen in your life. Or, yes. Is that okay? Clear? I think I think yeah. I understand your question. So yeah. why? Okay. So for me, it was. Um, I knew I had a problem with addiction. I tried to stop. I went to rehab. I did everything I could. But I think that it was, for me, that turning point was when I saw the pain inside. Like I said, I, I had, I'd lowered that wall of shame down with that writing exercise my daughter had me do. That allowed me to look at the true me when I looked in the mirror and see that I was in pain and that I, I could fix those things. Those were things that I could fix with counseling, with writing, with prayer, with whatever it is I needed to do, but I knew I needed to do some work. So I think that for me, it was coming to the realization that, okay, yes, you're in a bad place. You've done bad things. Addiction is powerful. But if you put the work in Misty, you can pull yourself up out of it. And that's what I did. I put the work in and I pulled myself up. Wow. Did that answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. Rafiq? Okay. Let's go to the last question. Hi, Mom. Yes. Yeah, there can see. <laughs> yes. Hi there. Rena. Uh, 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 I'm here, Zach from India. Oh, thank you for being here. You're yes. welcome. Happy, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> we know that today's world, most of the students are addicted to drugs. What's the advice you would like to give to the students to stay away from drugs? To respect your moment of choice and know it's going to become a lifetime of decisions for you. To become educated and when I speak to like college age kids, I tell them, if you think you want to go to a party and get high before you leave here today, I'm going to make sure you know what you're signing up for. Do the research, become informed and educated about drug addiction before you ever start it because it is serious. It's powerful. It's not discriminative. It will take anyone that gives it a chance down. So respect your moment of choice, do the research behind it and um, stay away from the people that are doing the things you don't want to do. Stay away from the people that aren't people of the caliber you want to be in life and then make your own path. Wow. Thank you very much. And, and in Thank fact, you, Missy. And, and well, the well. best part is Rena and Hannah, these are two sisters. They came up with a poem last couple of days back that was on cocaine. And there was one about drug as well for their school. I would love to see it sometime if they can. I would love to see that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you, you can just share that with me, Rena, and I'll just, uh, Hena, and I'll just share that with Misty. Is that okay? Please. Love that. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, pick three of people to ask me, ask questions, because I want them to come out of the shell. <laughs> Afreen. Get them. <laughs> Afreen, get out and ask a question. Afreen. Hi. Yes. Hello. I'm from Saudi Arabia. It's so nice to meet you. You too. Thank you. So my question is, your time through these challenges were, of course, really dark times in your life. But you know, we should always think positive. So what would be the one positive thing that you got out from your experiences? Well, there's many positive things, but I think that I would say the most positive is I learned about forgiveness, not only of other people, but of myself. And I think that's instrumental in a happy life is learning that to, to forgive our wrongdoings and forgive ourselves. Wow. That's, that's great. Now here's, there's one lesson that I learned that people always say forget and forgive, but the lesson that I learned from Misty today is you should not forget. You've yeah. got to for, forgive, but you should not forget because once you forget, then the, you, you lose that sort of uh, passion. That's the word she used. And, and I, I believe that's absolutely correct because if you forget about the incident that happened in your life, then there is nothing to motivate you. Right. Wow, but that's, you can't dwell on it. You can't, yeah. you can't sit, you know, when I say you can't forget, I don't mean 
have it front and present every day in your life yeah. either. But I mean, there's times we need to reflect back. Yeah, just to be aware of it, just to be aware of it, that there is something like that. Very good. The next person that I want to call upon is somebody who is hiding behind the camera, behind the curtain. It's Mohita Siwa. Mohita, ask your question. Where is Mohita? Mohita, are come you there? Come on out. Come on out. I want, I want people like you to come out and ask question. Mohita, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Hi. There you go. Hi. <laughs> yes, so ask I would like to ask, um, what would you say to us to be always positive? What would be your advice be to down to be positive? I think that it's something we have to train our brain to do, but we have to learn to find the silver lining in every situation. For instance, the grandbaby I mentioned to you, my first grandbaby, Eliana, that was born with all those health issues, she passed away this past January. And it was a choice. My daughter and my son-in-law had to make a choice to let her go and take her off of all of her life-saving medications because her, she had no quality of life left. And it was the hardest thing I've ever had to witness anyone do. But the positive in that is that it showed us the four years she was here, taught us all so much patience and compassion and empathy. Um, it opened my eyes to the whole world of, of the disabled people out there that I never even knew. I mean, in transparency, I was the person that would go to the local store and there would be, you know, 10 rows of handicap spots. And I'm like, really, we need 10 of them, you know, but now having lived with it and understanding it, it's like I, I'm educated now. So I would say, to train your brain to look for the positive in every situation, because there's a lesson there and everything as bad as it, it, it may seem that it is like me killing someone. The lady had cancer. She was dying. She was suicidal. I mean, you have to find something positive in it. And if you have a hard time finding the positive in it, get some trusted people that's in your life that's around you to help you find it. Because maybe sometimes we don't see things as clearly as someone next to us can but there's always something to find. Keep digging. Wow, wow. One yes. last question, one last question. And this would be Amina Rashid from UAE. I know this is a hard time that I'm giving. I'm a very bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> Amina Rashid, open up yourself. Got to ask a question right now. So next time you all come with at least one Hi, question. Hi, Fancy. Hi, Fancy. Hi. The shiny. Can I ask a question after this? After this, one question, one more. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Thank you. <laughs> Amina, go ahead. Yes, or, yes. Or, or, Hi, or, yes, Amina, go ahead, please. Good evening. Hello. Hi, Misty. Hello. Hi. Can you hear Hi. me? Are yes. we audible? Yes, yes, we are. We are. Good evening. Good evening, Misty. If you Hello. come make room back, yes, yes. Can I have a question now? Yes, please. Okay. If you have come across another drug addict, what feeling would you go? What, what are the feelings within you? Wow. It, when, you come, when you come across a drug addict now, right now in your life, what are the feelings that will go within you? Empathy. You are such a powerful lady. <laughs> I, I have a lot of empathy for them because having walked in those shoes now, I understand the pain that they're in. I understand mm -hmm. what they're hiding from. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of sorrow. Um, I used to be, you know, like I said, I've always been competitive. Yeah. So if I was in a room with a woman that was flirty and was getting all the attention of the men, you know, I used to couldn't stand her. I think, well, she's such a, you know, I just didn't like her. Now I look at a woman like that and I see pain and I think, what is she hiding? What is she hiding behind? Where is that coming from? Why is she so insecure? She feels she needs to be that way. So it's completely opened my eyes and I feel empathy. Wow. Putting yourself in the other person's shoes. Very yeah. simple yeah. as that. Okay. There was one last Thank question. You so much, Ms. You're Thank welcome. You. Okay. Yeah, the last question. Yes, uh, was that shiny? Yes, yes. Please yes. go ahead. Yes, please. 
Hi, Misty. How are you? Hello. I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, it was your story was very touching and very inspiring. Really touched my heart. You know, and I always feel that uh, uh, if people like uh, whatever happens to us, uh, we are the reason for that. I feel like that, uh, uh, like if we allow others to treat us in this way, they will do that. So we should be, we should never allow anybody others to treat us in that in that manner. You know, that's what what I feel always. And you did the right thing. You got out of that and you you chose your own way. Hats off to you. Thank you. And uh, my question is, what keeps you motivated? Like. Uh, uh, you are always, always you're motivated. Is there uh, any time that you get depressed? And what, what is the thought that comes to you that charges you up again? You know, first question is that. Second one is uh, like uh, success is a journey. So now you have already reached the pinnacle of success. You now what's next? What next? What is your next plan? This my two, these are my two questions. Okay. So what keeps me motivated is people like you. Um, interviews like this. It keeps me motivated to know that people are interested in transparency, that they're learning about it, that people that what reignites me and keeps me going is when people step up and share their story for the first time and seeing the weight off their shoulders and hearing their testimonies about how it's changing them. Um, I believe, you know, it's really hard. It's a process we learn if you become a speaker, especially to get on a stage, it's hard to learn that it's not about you. And when I first started speaking, I was like, how can it not be about me? It's my story. I'm on the stage. It is about me, but it's really not. Once you realize that you're the survivor and now you're an authority on it, it's not about you. It's about the person that needs to hear from you. So that's what keeps me motivated and keeps me going is, is seeing other people step into that and learn that as well. And I'm sorry, what was the second question? The first question was what motivates you? And Shani, what's the second question? Uh, your journey, now this, uh, the now you're in a pinnacle of your sexes, so what's next? Okay, so I don't, I don't really look at an end goal of success because I feel like we can always be better every day. Mm -hmm. So I don't put a cap on my success and say, oh, I'm here, I've made it, I'm successful. I don't look at it that way. I just get up every day with a grateful heart and say, I wanna be better today. And if that means changing my direction and doing something different, that maybe trying something new that I might reach someone that I hadn't reached before, then I'm gonna try that. But for me, it's just constantly reaching for success. I've never, I'm never gonna say I'm there, I've won because I feel like every day I can be better and give more. Wow. So powerful. So powerful. Misty, thank you very much from our heart. It was so nice to get you back. I know that you are a so busy person, interview after interview, your own shows and so forth, <laughs> but to get you back and to listen to you, to learn from you and then apply that in our life is something that is um, so powerful, especially I, 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 I want to thank you from my heart and I want to thank each and every person who are here uh, for taking your time and coming in here, joining live and asking questions for sure. I'm going to, uh, to send you the, the, the recorded version is going to go on YouTube within a few hours and so, but you took time and to come here. Thank you very much. I'd like everyone to go to the chat and say thank you. Thank you. Just go and say thank you. Yes, please. Is there something? Thank you, Minsty. Thank you. Okay. Thank okay. You. So, John, all of you unmute yourself and shout thank you. Okay. Unmute yourself and say thank you. That's thank the you. best. Thank you. 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 so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you so oh my goodness, you guys so are gonna make <laughs> Can yes. I ask a question? <laughs> okay, you've got one one more person asking a question. Should we give uh, 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 Misty is the Misty is the guest. She has to say yes. She is <laughs> Yes. The guys are making me cry. Hi. Hi. Hi, okay. Misty. Yes. Hello. Please. Ask your question. I'm Anna Rizak from <laughs> India. Okay. Hi. Yes, please. Uh, what how you was uh, addicted and what helped you to control? One more time, please. How you was addicted and what helped you to control it? 
How was I addicted? Yeah, uh, no, the addiction part is we spoke about that earlier. Let's let's talk about the second part. How did you control yourself? I didn't control myself. That was the problem. I had no control. I was ex I was completely powerless. I lost my job. I lost everything behind my addiction. It took someone dying to wake me up. And unfortunately, that's the sad part. Each of us have our what we call rock bottom. We never know where it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, or what it's going to be. Um, people ask me all the time, well, I'm, an, I'm addicted. How can I stop? I don't have the answer. I was not able to stop. What I tell them is, I can tell you what's going to happen if you don't. Wow. That's what I can tell you. Wow. I don't have the magic wand to, to teach anyone how to stop, but I can help you learn to love yourself and identify what you're trying to hide behind the drug and maybe start working on that. Actually, there's a, I want to just have a little plug yeah. real quick. Sure, sure. In my book, there is a chapter called COPE, C-O-P-E, mm -hmm. and that is actually a four-step method that I, that I designed um, to teach you how to evolve and learn that self-forgiveness. So if um, anyone has my book is, or wants is it to get available it, on a, is it available on Amazon? Amazon, any, any bookstore, even Walmart and Target even have it. Um, or you can go just straight to my website, which is mistylane.com. If you order it off my website, um, well, it's going to be different because it's going yeah, to a different yeah. country. Yeah, Amazon would be the best way then. That's yes. True. What goes okay. up? Just, just go to Amazon, just go to Amazon and you can type the title, which is given there very clear what goes up as, as uh, in a little more up. You, you can lift a little more up. Yes. You, you can just type the name itself. If you just type the name of the author, you will get the book. That's the easiest yes. thing that I do normally. So thank every you. Chapter, yeah. yeah. Every chapter, I end every chapter with an educational note, a how to, what would, you know, what I should do. I don't, it's not just a straight read. There, there is work involved. Like every chapter I give advice on how to change something or do something. Yeah. Wow. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Missy. Thanks. So once again, I want everyone to shout. <laughs> thank you, Missy. Thank, thank, thank you, Missy. Thank, thank you. 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 I can't thank wait you. to read your poem. Your, your, um, Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, you, take you, much. Much. you take care. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Misty. Thank you, Misty. And you're very beautiful. Wow. Oh my you're very beautiful <laughs> as well. You're I so bright and happy. Please, Sensei. Uh, uh, I have remember, one question, please. Remember, remember about the sugar and and waxing your hair. Okay. And yes. Then, <laughs> yeah. Remember that. <laughs> So thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, all of can you I can ask one question, please? Yes, please quickly. Yes, if go can. ahead. One minute, just only one minute. Okay. Yeah, okay. okay. Which one is the biggest addiction in your life? Food. <laughs> I struggle with food more than anything else. Yeah. Food addiction, because I tend to use food as my, my crutch for, for everything. Mm. And like I said, we're all a work in progress. Um, I'm still struggling and, and I work through the steps just like everyone else every day. But I think that to encounter, to, to get past it, we have to just remember every day to wake up with a grateful heart. Be grateful for what we do have positive in our life and not focus on the negative. Thank you, thank you. Somebody, can, somebody says, if you can come out from the fire, the sunlight never, it will damage. So mm -hmm. how is your experience? I'll, I think I think we, we have to leave uh, Misty because she's getting delayed now. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mujib. Thanks a lot for the, Thank the last question. Thank you. Me. Thank you very much. And I want everyone to come to my WhatsApp and give your feedback. How was it? Right. Thank you very much, Misty. Thank you Thank you have you a so lovely much. day. Have a great night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.